Hey friends, I hope you're hungry, because I came here to cook today. I'll be giving you my thoughts on the TWID and skill-based matchmaking in general, which is kind of like an infinite money glitch for content creators. Remember that these are my opinions. Pause for dramatic effect. And although I recognize the amount of influence a content creator has to sway a future game decision, I've always done a good job to separate my personal feelings on a subject to instead champion for what is overall best for the game's health, which usually involves increasing the player population. Obviously, we don't have access to the suite of data that Bungie devs have, so it's difficult to predict and understand why things exist in the game the way they do. With the video opening out of the way, know that this is going to be a long-winded video that doesn't have any meaningful background video, so I highly recommend you listen to this while knocking out some chores, and you've probably already seen an Asacross video where he reads all of this. Maybe you read it yourself. Read it yourself and then come back to this video if you'd like. You really don't have to though because I'm giving the highlights and responding uh, with an opinion on these highlights. So let's start off with State of Crucible, general PvP. Pretty much what's happening is the backfield spawns are moving up, which makes the map effectively uh, play a lot faster. And I think that's a huge W. I'll be getting some more ambitious 7th columns. Then it says the map waiting. I don't even remember all the maps currently available for sixes, but I sure love to queue up into Javelin 4, Endless Veil, vale, Midtown, Widow's Court, Distant Shore, and Dead Cliffs. I dislike queuing into, well, pretty much all the maps that they listed, and Citadel, and Cauldron, Wormhaven, Radiant Cliffs, and Anomaly. To be clear, I don't personally hate all these maps in isolation, it's just when bad matchmaking forces impossible retakes due to lack of teammate confidence, that I begin to find major frustration on my disliked maps. As for the new maps, I still don't think I have enough experience to fully tell if I like them or not. Off the top of my head, I dislike Cirrus Plaza's lack of floor and Dissonance's artificial ceiling and see-through objects. I'm still a noob at Eventide, and I don't even know which side of the map I prefer, nor do I even have a game plan on it, so I'll check back in with y'all in the future when I feel that I am finally good at those maps. Next up is Lobby Balancing. I'm excited to see the new Snake Draft because I firsthand see how much a fire team can skew the match outcome. However, I'm not sure that Lobby Balancing is the only variable to blame for lopsided matches. I understand that there has to be a loose enough matchmaking to have matches exist in the first place within a reasonable time. I understand that when I try to win, that I am a statistical anomaly, so the game can't realistically balance the lobbies around me. So at the end of the day, for the sake of a healthy population, I completely understand that consistently having teammates that shoot back is a pipe dream. And if I wanted teammates that shoot back, I'd be asking for stricter skill-based matchmaking, which could lead to even longer queues and worse connections, which ultimately lead to a faster bleed of the population. Or at least that's what I thought before reading the Activision document that I'll go over soon. Obviously, I wouldn't champion for what's worse for the total population, and all things considered, I think the root issue is skill assessment of a player. There are so many variables that can define a skilled player. If players like me are really an anomaly, then I'd argue that it's okay for the odd blowout to happen when we tilt the chair forward because it's just a numbers game. There's so few of us. I really don't think it's okay to hold five New Light players hostage to offset my existence. Next up, the Mercy Rule really impedes on a play session. Maybe players really outright quit the game when they're blown out. I just don't know for sure. Activision seems to think so. Me personally, Mercies in either direction are called too soon. I just want to shoot at Guardians that shoot back and change their game plan accordingly. I hope I'm not asking for too much because that's pretty much the same as PvE experiences. You know, you just learn the pattern once and you just win forever. At least that's what I would think. Sorry for like the pause there, have a drink. It uh, rhymes with Bisky from Hunter Hunter. If I put high effort into editing this, I'd have some sinister music fading in right here because I'm about to talk about uh, this wonderful document, Matchmaking Series 2. I will have the link in the description. It's the Activision Blizzard skill-based matchmaking study. So before you immediately put your fingers in your ears, Remember that the skill-based part of skill-based matchmaking is not binary. It's a spectrum. 
and there are lessons to be learned from both extremes. While I read highlights from this document, I'll try not to cherry pick, but I want you to keep in mind the definition of cognitive dissonance, which is a psychological state that occurs when a person holds contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. And as some of you go through this, everything's going to be screaming at you that uh, basically you're going to come to this conclusion. Your version of chill is someone else's matchmaking demon that they might as well go AFK against because even if they try their hardest, nothing is being done. So just want you to think about that. So now let's go over the highlights. Now, starting with the document highlights, the first that I would say is that there is a negative feedback loop of, in their own words, constantly rising higher average skill, which leads to a shifting lower skill bracket from the players quitting. In other words, skill creep. Then, when blowouts happen, players leave. They have two graphs on this uh, document. Let's see if I find them really quickly. It's the one about quitters. Players returning within 14 days with no SBMM. And then with extreme strict SBMM. The quit charts, they're funny. Yeah, it's one of these, but y'all can look through it yourself. I'm just going to tell you that I found the graphs pretty funny because it showed that the negative feedback loop can happen in either direction with either no SBMM or the most extreme version of SBMM. This makes me wonder how X Defiant is doing, considering that it has a no skill-based matchmaking policy. I did a quick Google search on the global population of X Defiant, and I noticed that it's steadily declining, but I'm not sure if it's too soon to tell if that's beyond what is natural for new game hype wearing off. So after reading about half the document, you'd be coming to the logical conclusion that the ideal system would be to protect low skill players while giving light skill based matchmaking to the rest of the population. But that's the exact moment in this document where they drop the bombshell of saying that they've tried this in the past. They've tried to protect the bottom 25% of players and allow looser matchmaking for the remaining 75% of players, it had negative effects on player counts in two weeks with inc increased quit rates and reductions in total hours played, both of which are well established as negative indicators of self-reported fun. You can search that exact quote in here. With those highlight mentioned, I'll start with my opinions on the matter. Try to listen to this whole section and not just a single sentence here or there. I am receptive to the idea that these companies might have a skewed perception of skill-based matchmaking's benefits because no one, well besides X Defiant, has taken the risk to abolish it long-term enough to see a difference in player culture. However, in my opinion, no company logically makes decisions that reduce long-term revenue. There might be a bias due to the player base already being acclimated to skill-based matchmaking. It's like jumping from a warm tub to a cold pool. It's a system shock. No wonder lower skill players quit. That being said, am I just a freak? A statistical anomaly who doesn't quit a new hobby, activity, or game just because the majority of players are better than me? Is that weird? Now, I'll level with you. I understand the nightmare scenario of not being able to participate in head-to-head -head PvP because of a huge disparity in skill. An example would be like if I, let's say something I'm really bad at, if I tried to play basketball against professional NBA players. I don't think a team of players like me would even have possession of the ball at all for the whole game. The score would be something like 100 plus to zero, we wouldn't even score a point, and we'd have the same amount of impact trying our hardest or not trying at all which to everybody involved in that match feels like a huge waste of time. I know what I just said is an extreme scenario, and it isn't the reality of random matchmaking for all games. For most beginners, learning and improving would still be possible because more often than not, they will encounter the average, which isn't necessarily an insurmountable opposing team. This is again talking a random matchmaking scheme. After all, I and many others are first-hand examples that you can climb to the top both with and without 
strict skill based matchmaking. If you're what if you're in what I call the skill island bracket, you'll notice some very strange trends with the matchmaking where you feel that your fate is predetermined. And while I'm not saying or implying Destiny 100% has an algorithm, I will say that having algorithms work both for and against me feels terrible. I truly feel like these games give out punishment and pity matches where the whole population takes turns with predetermined results regardless of whether or not players are trying or not trying because the team to team skill disparity is that extreme in the match. The thought process to why these algorithms are beneficial to player retention is rooted in gambling studies. And again, if the play if the company is trying to make the most amount of future revenue possible, is that not a great conspiracy theory to have to explain the inconsistency of reaching the pinnacle of skill but not being able to significantly influence every match you encounter? It's too consistent. It just breaks all laws of probability. If skill-based matchmaking, outlier protection, and lobby balancing exist simultaneously, then what can possibly explain these impossible matchups? Whether it's algorithms or not, I acknowledge that from a sheer numbers perspective, skill-based matchmaking will always struggle to find and start matches with both high and low skill anomalies respectively. The connection and queue times will otherwise suffer too much to be playable, and at the end of the day, I don't think that there is a universal solution. Perhaps the question we should be asking is why do most FPS players hate playing against their own skill level? Could it be that the game balance doesn't scale to the absolute top? Could it be that the best playstyle to win is stale to play? Could it be that they can't deviate strategies or loadouts because they're too skilled to fall out of outlier status? Could it be a universal player culture shift over the past decade? I can't answer those because players like me are what makes them quit. And it's poetic too because it's not like I'm hiding some secret scroll that gives them unlimited gaming power when they unravel it. I'm outright helping them, coaching, and scrimming players so that they can be better than what we think the best player is right now. Maybe population decline in these games is just inevitable. Again, in my opinion... I think that the four most significant ideas to stop a population bleed in these FPS games are practice tools like bot arenas, etc. Practice modes to help accelerate the growth of new players into the middle of the bell curve. Then we want frequent tournaments and or solid rank based systems to encourage players to focus on those instead of being an impossible outlier in casual public matchmaking. Then we need to have specific niche areas to accommodate specific likes and interests within a game. For example, party modes and competitive modes can exist in the same game, but separately. I anticipate game failure when devs try to make a competitive party mode. Like how the hell is that supposed to work anyway once players hit a baseline skill? Anyway, back on subject, while there's definitely a sweet spot to hit in terms of specificity versus, did I say that right, versus stealing population from other generic game modes, I'd argue that the players seeking these environments are a couple pain points away from outright playing a different video game anyway. And then the fourth reason would be an official server browser so that they can also sell these for extra revenue, by the way. I know Battlefield did that. They made a lot of money. Uh, this can help players self-police each other to solve the issues that the devs can't or won't handle. All this being said, although I don't quit the game, I'm not immune to quitting matches. In fact, I'd admit that I'm one of the biggest quitters in matchmaking right now. Selfishly, it's for a myriad of reasons that speed up content creation. This is a certified don't hate the player, hate the YouTube game moment. But to contrast that, I am that MF that puts the cart back when I go to the grocery store. So I do understand the value of following cues to not disrupt, disrupt an orderly system. And I think that brings us on to the quitting section of the TWAB. So in my opinion, they need to tackle the root of the problem, not the symptoms. Quitter penalties lead to intentional throwing since the reward for doing so is to have a bad situation end sooner and have skill-based matchmaking move closer to giving you a better overall experience. But players quit for all sorts of reasons, not just because there might be better players on the enemy team. It's maybe you quit for the map, maybe you wanted to use something close quarters and you got disjunction five times in a row. 
Uh, maybe you quit because there's a fire team present. You recognize all three names. You look at your team. You see their new lights, and that just doesn't add up. Uh, matchmaking imbalance can happen in either direction. I can't tell you the amount of blowout wins that I leave because it's just going to mercy anyway, and I'd rather just get into a longer match immediately than wait for my team to cause a mercy without my presence. Like I, do, I could just say, okay, they're still going to mercy it. Another reason is if I notice a mutual friend, uh, because I'm a content creator, I want to spare them the attention of weirdos on the internet. Like if I match against Datto while I'm going for a cryosthesia gameplay, that is not the time to be dunking on Datto because it would just like put so much unnecessary attention towards him that I don't think it does either of our channels a benefit. So I gentlemen the possibility of that happening whatsoever and just leave. So just so you know, part of thinking like a content creator. I want to make sure those relationships are as good as possible all the time. Uh, the biggest takeaway here is that because of a high school player's presence, their team is not enjoying their experience regardless of if they quit or not. Those teammates were going to get farmed to offset the high school player's presence, and if the high school player tries their hardest, it will only extend the figurative cage match farm that they unintentionally subject their teammates to. So if an experienced player notices the flaws of matchmaking, they quit because it gets them to dynamic games faster. If a quitter penalty is added, the experienced player will just AFK until the match ends while doing some other task on their monitor until the match ends. I know you can report for that, but it doesn't matter here. Uh, while I know this will halt some other quitters for sure, I know that ultimately this won't succeed in its goals and maybe even will lead to more negative friction within teams. High school players' teammates are going 6-22 and 22, regardless of if the high school player AFKs or not. Most of us are leaving or AFKing disjunction regardless of being in a bad standing or not. Most of us are leaving if we see three tourney players in a fire team on the opposing team because even with the future changes, we all know that that's too much of an outlier for matchmaking to realistically answer. In a six-man fire team, I will quit when all but one of the enemy team quits because it's faster to get into the next match than to wait on the anime indomitable human spirit player to quit on their own volition rather than artificially extending how long it takes the mercy by an extra three minutes. I don't see how these changes ultimately change player behavior positively. The real issue is skill assessment, lack of niche game modes, and low population from other sub-related game issues. Now we're on the ability section. Awesome, we got changes to clone and swarm. Good start. Where's smoke grenade or smoke melee? Where is that? That one was so over buffed for no reason. Now we move on to special ammo economy. Um, this screams to me cherry pick data, but I'll just go with what I have here. Uh, the shotgun percentage is really high no matter what. And that makes me wonder if shotguns are too easy for the reward. And this might require a separate video altogether, but I'm definitely thinking this. Haven't thought it all the way through. In my opinion, I really dislike when snipers are at the absolute top of high skill gameplay because I love primary gameplay. But some map and mode design make things like shotguns, for example, feel mandatory to get curious and progress the game state into being dynamic again. I'm not saying shotguns should necessarily be nerfed, but maybe double primary should get some sort of bonus for choosing not to have the corner checker. The best example of these extremes in Destiny history is when Antaeus Ward was at the top of the meta, and let's say you're playing the map Endless Veil. Vale. There are straight up some angles that are impossible to navigate on that map because there's just not enough space to backpedal or bait or anything like that. You are just dead if they own a shotgun and you don't. Surely you can also see how this is problematic for what should be the replayable part of the game, PvP. Bungie has mentioned a rich get rich scenario with the meter system of special ammo, and I understand that rationale. However, modes like Mayhem and Scorched exist, so why can't a hyper-competitive mode also exist? At the end of the day, it's the player's choice to choose the playlist that fits their skill and their genre. So, if a player wants to run it down and trade for the entire match jousting, who am I to say that that isn't fun for them? In the same regard, I guarantee players would queue into an unlimited sniper ammo playlist. Maybe a perfect aerial effectiveness playlist. It's really on Bungie to curate specific environments, rather than force all the population to experience the gray bland garbage playlist for quote unquote everyone. Next up is Trials. I see the re reverted some old card behavior, but in my opinion, I dislike Trials. It's I'm not the target audience, and 
I'm also always happy when they make it easier for the average player to get the exclusive loot because I find the game more fun when you have the loot. I don't find the loot chase fun. Uh, personally, I have no problem setting aside 40 minutes for a flawless solo card, but I know that the main population doesn't have that luxury. I particularly like the ferocity card option, but unfortunately they're reverting that one. I see the vision they're going for with fireteam based uh, reward incentives. That's pretty cool. Personally though, I think that adept weapons are overvalued and genuinely are worthless for 99% of the player base. Competitive. This is the closest one to my heart and probably should have been the longest section to talk about, but I don't really have that much to say with it. I'm just so depressed by it. Uh, Clash with Radar was a mistake. The game mode is a slog for any player with a competitive mindset. Please, for the love of the traveler, just create specific environments for specific audiences. Uh, next up is rewards. I don't care about rewards, but I acknowledge that their existence will lead to a healthier population. The biggest W's would be continual rose drop options and high stat artifice armor, which is honest, honestly BS that high stat artifice armor only really drops from one source in the game, and that's Grasp of Avarice. Enough comp. Let's talk about Iron Banner. Now, there's a lot of data here. I don't really trust the deciphering of the data here. Iron Banner popularity wanes based on rewards, the mode, matchmaking scheme, and opportunity cost with other playlists. If Trials were out or a normal control playlist, you might see less Iron Banner players depending on, again, maybe the reward quality. Like, if no one wants the new gear and they have perfect rolls of the old gear, why would they play the inferior playlist? A wins giving bonus engrams is great, but long term glimmer will still be the bottleneck. So effectively for an endgame player like myself that pretty much is just fishing for very specific roles, um yeah, winning doesn't matter whatsoever. So just play for fun. And I truly do do mean for fun. Like straight up if the match ends, it ends. You're just waiting on glimmer. Overall, the matchmaking adjustments sound okay, but I think Iron Banner has a long way to go to flesh out its identity. A big one for me personally is, where is freelance? I am so tired of matching competent and keyword coordinated teams while I have the equivalent of lost new lights on mine. I'd take a freelance option in a heartbeat. I also enjoy matching only team versus team, so I'd have no problem waiting in the other playlist for a proper team match. Perhaps give a bonus rep reward for those solos that brave uh, the backfill of those hellish matches. After reading that Activision uh, document or whatever, I have a little bit different of an opinion of this, but at first, I definitely think the uh, Mercy rule is dumb. If players quit when matching against higher skill opponents, it makes sense that Bungie would want a Mercy rule to stop the unenjoyable experience sooner. I still think that they might be calling it too soon, but in the past, I'd practically play a scoreless mode like I enjoyed in Battlefield 3 and 4. Like, we'd set a one-hour time limit on a public server browser, Conquest, and just play to play. I know, what a crazy concept, right? But these companies out here implying that I'll never revisit a game if high-skilled players can't carry me to victory or whatever. Moving on. Exotic class items. Y'all know that personally, I'm on team. Just let us have everything deterministically so we can use the gear we want in the content we want. But officially... This is where, all the way back to the opening of this video, I'm advocating for what I don't personally like because it's healthier for the game. I champion for the system that psychology-wise leads to the most players enjoying the game so that we have a bigger population for more enjoyable LFG and PvP environments, which typically means that there has to be some form of RNG and gambling looter-shooter elements to get the players invested. I also don't think that this class item is the most obvious pick for most meta builds. However, y'all also know that I like variety in my PvP sessions, so I see the niche value in many exotic class item combinations, which means my ass is watching YouTube while manually running the chest route because one, I don't want to deal with other people, and two, I value my 10,000 hour account enough to not unnecessarily risk it with obvious macros. Oh yeah, I said it. Teachers collecting the homework. Speaking of macros, Bungie, yet again, avoiding an official stance on macros. Like, they are doing the most gymnastics possible to not mention this shit. Sega, on the other hand, has no issue stating exactly where they draw the line with macros. And if you were curious, it's 
Should not affect the action RPG combat, but you can use it for menuing accessibility reasons, like let's say deleting a, a lot of useless materials in your inventory or something like that. Like they straight up don't care. But they don't want you hitting an 11 string combo in combat with a macro. I'm just overall tired of macro crouch spammers pretending like we both don't know what they're doing. And I, I really don't want to ask the teacher to collect the homework, but really at this point, Bungie has to have cons cons some consistency in their vocalization and enforcement. For those who don't know, there is still some PvP tech that macros can make 100% consistent. And yes, these are things that do influence a match outcome. I personally don't care about uh, PvE macros at all, although I know that that could be an issue for speedrunning. But the bigger issue with speedrunning Destiny 2 is that it's a live service game, so any accolade that you accumulate really can't be replayed by anybody in the future, so it doesn't hold as much merit to me. So for that reason, I would say like I straight up do not care about PvE. I'd love for them to green light using macros to delete the stacks of consumables I have in my inventory or to do something like buy 20 gunsmith engrams so they all go to my postmaster and then a different macro to delete all of them from my postmaster. I know they have wish wall macros. They have macros that hold checkpoints in this game and those are all super useful and appreciated by the community. But I tr uh, trust me on this, you don't want the PvP ones existing in PvP. So, can Bungie just... Please greenlight us so I don't have to risk a 10,000 hour account just because I want to use the checkpoint bot or something like that. Like, that'd be such a stupid reason to ban me, yet they absolutely could because I use the checkpoint bots all the time. So, I don't know. I'm sure that in some way it's a gray area on the TOS. I just want them to have some consistency. Uh, back on track, I don't care about the dupe protection, farming methods, or whatever with these class items because it really just matters on Bungie's end for whatever is driving the players to play in the first place. Like, me personally, I'd fiend for a Lion Rampant Lucky Pants combo, but that doesn't exist on these exotic class items. So I just spend my YouTube viewing time also grinding patrol chests so I can collect all the interesting combos to be a content creator. Final section in this twelve is the Brave Arsenal Attunement. Y'all know in my previous videos that Onslaught is my melatonin right now. I grinded the hell out of it, but I still want some alternate rolls on gear, so I am thankful that they fi finally brought Attunement back. The Shinies are still staying in the past. I love the Shinies because it's like a perfect muscular arm handshake compromise of the players that really just play this game to gamble and the players that want the gear to play the game. So Shinies are a good way of tricking the gamblers into letting the deterministic players have a little bit more determinism. So for that, I really like it. I'm glad they're exclusive too. Even better. I hope they do that with way more stuff in the game. Seems like such a smart compromise and a good trick to make the player base happier. Uh, when I say I don't like Onslaught, that usually gives a lot of question marks to the viewers and it'll probably be a comment on this video if I don't go into it. So I don't want to leave y'all hanging. In short, it's a solve mode with very limited replayability and challenge. And then this brings up the next comment of like, Oh, step off the high horse, like, what do you think good PvE is then, if this isn't good PvE? And my answer is, I'd like to see Bungie expand on a roguelike activity like the Coil, but across all Destiny PvE landscapes. The idea would be starting from a brand new Guardian, and progressing through random stages with random modifiers, and earning slash collecting different exotic and legendary gear and subclass perks to better your chances of succeeding far enough for a higher score. The new Prism subclass is a perfect prototype for how crazy the power level can get on deeper runs. Imagine combining stuff that had no business being combined, uh, like four or five, six aspects with 50 fragments or something like that. I mean, you can go crazy on this. Anyway, Fantasy Star Online is the main PvE game I've played in the past, and that had a challenge mode back in the year 2000 and an endless mode that dabbled and succeeded in this idea I'm bringing up right now. And yes, when I want to play PvE, I put my money where my mouth is, and I leave Destiny 2 to find it somewhere else. The saddest part of all of it is a decade later, I still cannot say the same thing about Destiny PvP, which is why I have to be like a college research student, read all these damn articles and blogs, and talk about how PvP can be improved in the future, because... No other game does it like Destiny, and I want it to be the best version it can be, and I also want another development studio to make something close to as good as Destiny so it can have some competition, so we can see some real changes to both games, 
and maybe we'll get a good arena shooter for the first time and let me check my calendar here close to two decades i really think halo was the last really good console one anyway friends that uh brings us to the end of the twit i had a light script with me it wasn't a light script uh i still hope you enjoyed it I hope you got those dishes done, the chores done, and stop procrastinating uh, procrastinating your homework. I know what you're doing. I will see y'all in the next. Bye.